Glad to see you today. Let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we thank you for the work you've come to do in um, sending your Son and Spirit into this world to uh, enlighten our minds and encourage our hearts. And we thank you that throughout history, the 2,000 years since Jesus has come the first time, and as we wait for his return, we thank you that you have raised up many men and women um, in your church whom you have gifted greatly. And particularly this morning, we thank you for John Owen, for the work that uh, you did through him and for the influence that he still holds. Thank you for his very wonderful and helpful teaching. Thank you for how he advanced uh, our confession, how he advanced our doctrine. And we pray as we spend a little bit of time on this man this morning that you would help us to understand your word better. Help us to understand theology more rightly and to love it. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Come on in and have a seat. I'd encourage you to sit over here, please, if you can. Um, today we're looking at John Owen. Last week, well, we're in the middle of the, the three Johns. That's what I call them. Most people say that the three Johns are the most important three theologians for the English-speaking world. So last week was Calvin. And by the way, I tried to do way too much last week, so I apologize for that. Uh, this week is John Owen, and next week is John Athen, Jonathan Edwards, uh, who's the greatest American-born theologian ever. John Owen, most say, is the greatest English-speaking theologian ever. So we've been, for the last couple of weeks, with Luther and Calvin in the 16th century. Today we move forward about 100 years to the 17th century. Uh, you see John Owen's dates right here. 1616 was the year he was born, which is the same year that Shakespeare died. And he lived all the way till 1683. So his life, for the most part, spanned the 17th century. Uh, and the 17th century is a very, very important century in the history of theology because it was the century of the Puritans. Um, really, J.I. Packer says the Puritan century, quote unquote, is from 1560 to 1660. Uh, so John Owen lived right in the middle of that. Uh, Packer calls the Puritans... Um, the redwoods of Christian theology. They're like a redwood tree as compared to all other trees that are theologians. And he says that Owen is the tallest of the redwoods. Uh, and I agree, Owen is the greatest Puritan. So we're going to just talk about him and think about him as the representative of Puritan theology. <clears throat> uh, he was an Englishman, and I don't know English history very well at all, but as I was studying Owen, uh, it, came, it struck me that the 17th century in England was a very, very uh, dangerous time and a very important time as well. It's one of the key uh, centuries, key eras in English history as well uh, because, as we'll talk about in just a minute, Owen lived during Cromwell and the English Civil War and the Interregnum and uh, all that stuff. Died right before the Glorious Revolution, which was in 1688. So, anyhow, let's talk a little bit about Owen the Man and I'm just going to focus on two aspects of his theology today, because like Calvin, uh, you could talk about Owen, we could do a whole class on Owen easily. Uh, he's a supremely influential theologian, which is amazing since his style of writing was horrible. Um, he himself said that his writing was so bad that he doubted whether anyone would read his works, whether they would be effective at all. Um, he's very difficult to read. He's not... Uh, he's very verbose, as Brett just mentioned to me. Owen is very verbose and uh, not, not at all easy. Um, he's tough to read. His diction isn't helpful. And much of what he says is very weighty. But if you can get through, through him, he's the best, one of the best there is. Um, just as a side note, there are being published now these editions of Owen's works. And you see there a key thing, abridged and made easy to read by R.J.K. Law, who's this Scotsman who works for Banner of Truth Trust. These are much, much better to read. So if you want to get into Owen, um, actually, this is what I recommend you start with. We're not going to talk about this book today, but it's called Communion with God, and it's a unique work. Owen spends like, time talking about how we commune with each individual person of the Trinity. Um, it's beautiful. It's very wonderful. And this is the edition you need. Anything you read by Owen, this is the edition you need. This is by far the easiest and I think the best of him. Here's The Glory of Christ, and we're going to talk about two other books today that have not yet been printed in this edition. Uh, this is, well, The Banner of Truth is the publisher. It's the Puritan paperback series. There's actually a, you can search, Google this deal. It's something like 
I can't remember the website. Oh, Monergism. Monergism Monergism.com has a deal where you can get like 35 Puritan paperbacks for something like 100 bucks, 150 bucks. It's a really good deal. And uh, both of those come along with that as as well as some of Owen's other stuff. So he is worth reading, but he's difficult to read. As I said, he's born in 1616, uh, the same year that William Shakespeare died, born in the middle of the Puritan century. And the goal of the Puritan movement, by the way, was to finish what the Reformation began. At least that's the way they termed it. They wanted to reform Anglican Church of England worship, uh, to establish righteousness in the public square, and to convert Englishmen, basically, to a very vigorous faith in Christ. So Owen dies right at the very end of the height of Puritan influence. His dad was a pastor. He had four siblings and a mom, obviously. He never mentions his mom or any of his siblings in any of his writings, and he mentions his dad once. Um, He went to grammar school at Oxford, which is going to play a very important role for the rest of his life. At age 10, um, he entered Queen's College, one of the colleges at Oxford at 12, which, by the way, was norm at that time. Uh, It's not like he was around a bunch of 20-year-olds when he was 12. That was a normal thing to do was... Uh, basically, your grammar school, high school, quote, unquote, education took place uh, in the university. So he entered Queen's College at 12. He got his bachelor's degree when he was 16 and his master's degree when he was 19. That was, by the way, exceptional. Uh, and he entered uh, a, what was called then a Bachelor of Divinity program, which was his, basically his Ph.D. work. But he never finished because the Anglicanism in uh, Oxford drove him nuts. And so he dropped out and actually never got his doctorate. Uh, In 1642, when Owen is still a young man, the English Civil War breaks out, which was Oliver Cromwell and the House of Commons versus the House of Lords. And they exiled Charles I. Well, they didn't exile him. They cut his head off. They cut off Charles I's head, and his son, Charles II, went into exile. And from 1642 to 1660, in English history, that's called the interregnum. There's 18 years there where there's no king in England. It's called the Commonwealth. For the first seven or eight years, the House of Commons, the Parliament, rules England. And then for the last half of it, basically Oliver Cromwell was a military dictator in England. Um, so these are right during the years of Owen's prime. So I want to talk a little bit more about his life. In 1643, he goes to London And he's 26 years old at this time, and some very important things happened to him there. First of all, he was converted. Um, Even though he's already been through his Ph.D. work in the Bible, and he's actually already a pastor, uh, most people say he's converted uh, while he's here. Others say it was merely an awakening. But the remarkable thing about it is that it's almost identical identical to Charles Spurgeon's conversion story. I don't know if you know that, but basically Owen went into this church where this no-name preacher was speaking. We don't know anything about this guy. We still don't know his name. And he heard him preach on Matthew chapter 8, verse 26, where Jesus stills the winds and the waves, and he says to his disciples, O ye of little faith. And the man was talking about faith in Christ, and Owen was struck by that, and he writes that he was immediately assured that he was born again of God. And uh, this stamped the rest of his life. So the first important thing that happened to him during his time in London is that he's converted. Secondly, he got married to a lady named Mary Rook. He was married to her for 31 years. She died before he did. And one of the amazing things about Owen is that they had 11 children together, 10 of whom died before the age of two. Um, The 11th made it to about the age 21, 22 or so, got married and had a terrible experience in her marriage. Her husband was abusive. She moved back in with the Owens in her early 20s and died there of consumption. So 11 children, all of whom he outlived, and he outlived his wife. And as I I was always looking at this, I'm just amazed that Owen could pastor anyone, much less do all that we're going to read about, given that if you break it down, and it doesn't go like this, but every three years he lost a child for his entire life, if you want to take it in those terms so horrible experience for him very traumatic very devastating 10 times 10 times that happened that um, that just blows me away so how did he do what he do while what he did by while facing that i i really have no idea so he got married 
during this time when he was still a young man. Also, in the late 16, uh, actually in the late 1630s, he published his first book. Now, you know, sometimes we, in our confession of faith, use what we call the canons of Dort, which come from the synod of Dort, which is where uh, the Calvinists answered the Arminians. Some of you are probably familiar with that. So that happened in 1618, 1619. So that's right uh, before Owen comes into his prime. And so that's still fresh in people's minds. And Owen's first book was about that. Here's what it was called. I love this title. A display of Arminianism being a discovery of the old Pelagian idol free will with the new goddess contingency advancing themselves into the throne of God in heaven to the prejudice of his grace, providence, and supreme dominion over the children of men. The publisher really should have changed the title. But as I said, (laughs) Owen is not easy to read. But that's his first book. In 1643, he became a pastor of a small town, a small parish in Fordham, Essex. And until that point, he was making money as a chaplain and as a tutor. And basically, he's pastor all of his life. And all of the books that he wrote come from his preaching ministry. And all of the books that he wrote have pastoral implications. He wrote them as a pastor with the intent to help pastor people. Uh, One more thing that happened to him in his early life. In 1646, when he was 30, he was invited by Oliver Cromwell to speak at Parliament uh, at 30 years old, which was a massive honor, a huge honor. And apparently he he tore it up, just brought his A-game that day and preached a great sermon. And uh, this message catapulted him into a political role for the next 14 years of his life. Oliver Cromwell made John Owen his personal chaplain. And basically, Owen, uh, this is a bad thing about Owen, in my opinion, he gave theological justification for Cromwell's wars, uh, particularly his religious persecution of Presbyterians in Scotland and England, and he also preached to the army. He preached, for example, the day after Parliament executed King Charles I, And he called that just retribution from God. So Owen is very tightly politically connected for most of his life. And he was part of some messed up stuff. Uh, We see again, by the way, uh, all the danger that comes when church and state are united. So Cromwell loves Owen and eventually makes Owen the dean of Christ Church, which is the largest college at Oxford. So he becomes dean of Christ Church, Oxford, is a close confidant of Cromwell, and from 1651 to 1660, he held that position. He also becomes the vice chancellor of Oxford. Now, I want you to think about that. This is really remarkable. He is like a full-time pastor, the chancellor of the most important university in England, in the world in that day. Uh, He's the admissions coordinator. He's a leading political figure, and he's a family man. And during those nine years, 51 to 60, he published 22 works. And they weren't like, you know, 25-page devotionals. They were thick, heavy things. So he was uh, a man that was just unbelievable in the amount of stuff he was able to produce. Like some of the other men we've studied already, Owen fits right in line with them. In 1660... He's fired uh, from his political role and fired from Oxford when Charles II comes back and ends uh, the Commonwealth in England. And then for the next 23 years, from 1660 until he dies, he's basically um, a fugitive pastor, as it were. It was a dangerous time to be a man who held the sort of convictions that Owen held because people were coming back wanting to persecute all those who had supported Cromwell during the Commonwealth, which Owen obviously had. So he moved around because it was dangerous to be a Puritan in those years. Uh, In 1662, he leaves the Church of England because they would not reform the Book of Common Prayer, and he basically lived in exile for the rest of his life. One interesting thing I learned is that uh, later in his life, in the mid-1660s, the first congregational church in Boston invited Owen to come be their pastor. Uh, He turned them down. He didn't want to go to the middle of nowhere out in Boston. Um, But that's an interesting thing to think about how it would have played out if Owen had come to the the States. Um, Also, at one point in his life, he shifted from Presbyterianism to Congregationalism. We won't hold that against him too much. But even more significantly, although he did some bad things, later in his life, he became a spokesman for tolerance uh, 
for both Anglican and Presbyterian forms of government and forms of worship. Uh, even while he was at, at Oxford as the dean, he had the authority, if he wanted to, to squelch Anglican worship, but he didn't do that. Uh, he allowed a group of Episcopalians to worship in rooms across from his own house, even. And his ideas of tolerance were so significant that one of his students, William Penn, uh, came to the States later on and founded Pennsylvania as a Quaker establishment, and it was famous uh, in those days, as you know, if you know your American history, for being a, a bastion of tolerance, religious tolerance. So Owen had great influence there. Uh, one other amazing story about Owen that I learned and didn't know before I started studying for this. He was good friends with John Bunyan. Uh, they were almost exact contemporaries. John Bunyan was an English pastor who wrote the most sold book in the history of the world other than the Bible, uh, The Pilgrim's Progress. More copies of that book have been sold than any other book in the history of humanity except for the Bible. Um, Owen, uh, Bunyan was the exact opposite of Owen. He was a poor little tinker, uh, a poor man who was an amazingly gifted preacher, and Owen spoke very highly of Bunyan's preaching. Actually, one time, Oliver Cromwell said to Owen, why do you like that guy's preaching so much? What's the deal with that guy? And Owen said something like, this is a paraphrase, I would give away all of my education, learning, and position if I could preach one sermon like he preaches. So he had great respect for Bunyan. Now, after Cromwell died, remember, it was a dangerous time to be a Puritan. Uh, Charles II was back, and he's persecuting the Puritans, and that's when John Bunyan was thrown into prison. Now think about this, Owen has all these really, really important political connections that he's developed over his entire life, and Owen never went to prison, even though he certainly could have, and a lot of men who held the exact same positions as him theologically and politically did go to prison, uh, but Owen worked hard to try to get Bunyan out of prison, and never succeeded in doing so, but he would all the time go and visit his friend in prison. And uh, as we know, Bunyan wrote The Pilgrim's Progress while in prison. So interestingly enough, one of the many interesting providences in history is that if Owen had succeeded in getting Bunyan out of prison, we probably would never have Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, furthermore, Bunyan gave Owen the first manuscript of the book. Uh, you can just imagine him handing it to John through the jail cell and John said, oh, that sounds good. You know, Bunyan didn't think that much of it, and neither did Owen. And so Owen went back to his office and sort of threw it on his desk, and a couple years later, picked it up and read it, and thought, huh, this is, I think this is publishable. And, you know, Bunyan is a tinker who's in jail. He didn't know anyone, but Owen knows everyone in London. And so Owen took this book, this manuscript, to his publisher and said, publish this book. And that's how Pilgrim's Progress got published. So Owen was very instrumental in the publishing of that book, the most important book ever written, probably, uh, by an Englishman. So, again, uh, that's just an interesting little fact of history. Also, Owen and Bunyan were buried together. Uh, Owen died in 1683, and Bunyan died five years later in 1688. And they were such close friends that uh, they share a tomb. So, Owen and Bunyan, good buddies. So that's a real brief summary of, of John Owen's life, a uh, very powerful political figure, a uh, very important theologian, um, very, very gifted and brilliant man. He wrote, uh, if you look at his, you could research this, he has 16 volume completed works that I would not suggest buying. Um, they're really poor. Someone needs to do like a PhD dissertation and translate or update Owen's work again. I'm not going to do that, but someone should. Um, they're, they're very difficult to read. Uh, again, the best way to get into Owen is to read these little short things from him. Um, he wrote a tremendous amount of stuff, so very, very important guy. What we're going to do is talk about two of, I think, two of his most important books and most accessible books as well. But first, does anybody have any questions about Owen's life or comments? All right. So two things I want to talk about uh, the rest of our time. Really, two books that he wrote. The first thing I want to talk about is this book, which is called The Mortification of Sin. Um, this is one of the most pastoral books you will ever read. This edition uh, has an introduction by J.I. Packer, and it's not that good. This has not been updated like these ones have. It's very 
not very, it's somewhat difficult. And the print, even the, the typeset is not well done. Um, but you can see my copy just uh, underlining like crazy in it because it's, it's, in my life, personally, undoubtedly the most, the most important and helpful book I've ever read on sanctification. And I think the most important book ever written on sanctification. Um, this book really is uh, a collection of his sermons on Romans chapter 8, verse 13, where Paul writes, If by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Or if by the Spirit you mortify, kill, put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. And this is very typical of the Puritans. He does a little bit of exegesis and expo exposition of the text, and then there's like, you know, there's five pages of that, and then there's 50 pages of application uh, based on one verse. So this whole book really is application of one verse. It's uh, 180 pages. And uh, it's just an extremely, extremely helpful book uh, for practical Christian living on how to kill sin in our lives. And uh, you could sum up the book basically by saying this, um, be killing sin or it will be killing you. That's pretty much his point. Uh, has anybody read that book? Anybody? Okay, a couple of you. Not surprising, those two have read it. Um, very, very great book. So I want to just take a little bit of time talking about uh, what, he, what he says, trying to summarize it briefly for us to give you, my goal is to give you a, enough of a taste that you'll want to read it. You can read it, trust me, it's, it's a wonderful thing to read. A uh, very, very, very helpful book. So, um, there's an introductory idea that he, he talks about at the very beginning. And I have it there as a quote in your outline. If you want to look at it. Here's what he writes. Suppose a man to be a true believer and yet finds in himself a powerful indwelling sin, leading him captive to the law of it, consuming his heart with trouble, perplexing his thoughts, weakening his soul as to duties of communion with God, disquieting him as to peace, and perhaps defiling his conscience and exposing him to hardening through the deceitfulness of sin. What shall he do? What course shall he take and insist on for the mortification of this sin, lust, this temper, or corruption? So that's the question of the book. How do you fight persistent and indwelling sin? How do you deal with those things that continue to plague me, plague you? Those, those things that after you've been a Christian for some time, you think, man, I should have been able to overcome this by now. It's ridiculous that I'm still struggling with this same sin that I was struggling with 10 years ago, 20 years ago, however long ago. It's amazing. How, how am I supposed to overcome this? That is why Owen wrote this book, and it is utterly and absolutely brilliant. Um, the main thing that he says in answer to that question, how do you mortify sin, is that it's only going to happen by the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember Romans 8.13. And he spends a lot of time talking about just this one clause. If by the Spirit you mortify the misdeeds of the body. There's some great quotes here. He writes, A man may easier see without eyes, speak without a tongue, than truly mortify one sin without the Spirit. All attempts then for mortification of any lust without an interest in Christ are vain. And then he writes, All other ways of mortification are vain. All helps leave us helpless. It must be done by the Spirit. Mortification from a self-strength carried on by ways of self-invention unto the end of a self-righteousness is the soul and substance of all false religion in the world. Um, so it's very, very gospel-centric. He, he continually emphasizes the idea that only by the power of the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives, will we ever overcome any sin? That is a persistent emphasis throughout the book. But it's always um, accompanied with a persistent emphasis on practical steps and helps for how that's to take place. Uh, he talks about how the Spirit mortifies sin. And he lists three ways and then elaborates on them at length. And the first way very much strikes me. He says, the first way the Spirit mortifies sin is by causing our hearts to abound in grace. And then the third way is very similar. He brings the cross of Christ into the heart of a sinner by faith and gives us communion with Christ in his death and fellowship in his sufferings. In other words, faith in the gospel is the way in which we kill sin. 
And, uh, you know, it's easy for me to say, that's true, that sounds right, that sounds good. And I realize for you and also for me in my life, that's difficult to, to think about and to make it seem practical. But I've never read anything else uh, that does it as well as this book does. Um, how believing the gospel actually empowers us in practical day-to-day Christian living. Um, he also talks about there under D, 2D on your outline. If this is the Spirit's work, how do we participate in it? What active role do we play? And there's a wonderful quote there that I think is one of the best definitions of sanctification uh, that I've ever read. He basically says the Spirit works in us and on us, but he doesn't do that um, as if we are, we are robots or something like that. Rather, he uses our understandings, he writes there, and wills and consciences and affections agreeably to their own natures. He works not against us or without us, but in us and with us, so that his assistance is an encouragement as to the facilitating of the work and no occasion to neglect us to the work itself. So anyway, what he's saying there is that we have an active role to play in our own personal holiness. The Spirit is the, the power and the source by which that growth comes, but that doesn't mean we, that we just sort of let go and let God, as it were, that we sit back and do nothing. It means that we are diligent in the means of grace, believing all the while that as we are diligent in those things, the Holy Spirit of God is at work in our lives, transforming us and conforming us into his image. Uh, one other thing that struck me about how we participate is something he calls the universality of obedience. We participate by a universality of obedience. And this is, I think, extremely practical. What he's saying is that true killing of sin, okay, true killing of any sin only takes place when we are, when we are after every sin. In other words, uh, let me try and make that practical. We can't, it's not very helpful for us, according to Owen, to say, man, I am really struggling with um, lust. I'm going to focus on this and this alone and do my best to take care of this. Uh, and Owen would say, as you work on that and maybe make some progress in that area, you might be seemingly doing better in lust, but all the, well, all the while your pride has just ballooned and festered and grown. So to work on any one sin to the exclusion of others, as it were, is not very helpful. We must always be conscious and always be about killing every sin. Uh, that sounds overwhelming, and Owen meant it to sound that way because he's always trying to drive us back to the truth that it's the Spirit that kills sin. So per- participation by a universality of obedience, I think, was, uh, was very helpful. He also talks a lot about what mortification of sin looks like. And he lists three things there. Um, It consists in three things. A habitual weakening of sin, constant fighting and contending against sin, and, this is very important, in success. In eventual, over time, overcoming sin. Um, So he spends a lot of time on that as well. That's a really brief summary of the book. Uh, It's very very helpful. The last, let me see here, the last 90 pages are particular directions as to how to go about killing sin in your life by the power of the Spirit. And as I said, you know, I'll keep saying it, it's the best I've ever read on that subject. And uh, there's also another book, by the way, that was published maybe 10 or 15 years ago uh, that's intended to be uh, sort of a new mortification of sin and it's by a guy named chris lundgaard and it's called the enemy within that's another book i would recommend it's published by presbyterian reform publishing it's mid 90s or so chris lundgaard l-u-n-d-g-a-a-r-d um he's trying to update owen's work here for sort of more modern ears that's a very very good book as well that'll open the door, but if you really want to walk through the door and sort of explore the house, you should read Mortification. Doug. 
Yeah, good, good. Thanks. So there is a, a new banner of truth addition to mortification and sin that I need to get that I don't have that is better. That's funny that it says translated when he wrote in English, but that is true. It does, in a sense, need to be translated. So that's a brief brevery of mortification of sin, one of Owen's most important and uh, most helpful works. Any other questions about this book? Doug, this is your last comment, last one you're allowed. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one of the, I was rereading a lot of it over the last few weeks, and one of the things he says that struck me that is very convicting, one of the first directives he gives basically is, when you feel guilt over your sin, you should just sit there and wallow in your guilt and realize how utterly guilty you are before God and allow your guilt, as it were, to overwhelm you, and then go to the cross of Jesus. So, yeah, it's like he makes you feel guilty just by reading it and then says, are you feeling guilty? Good! You should keep feeling guilty. But it is very, very gospel, gospel-centered, as I said. It is also very, very convicting. Good. Other questions about the book? Highly recommended. Very good book. Okay, one other thing I want to talk about with Owen, and I think I've got enough time to do it. We'll see. Um, this is another book that he wrote that I want to spend the rest of our time on. Ben mentioned it a couple of weeks ago and said that he thinks on this subject it's, it's going to be unsurpassed until Jesus returns. And I completely agree. I think he's exactly right. The book is called The Death of Death in the Death of Christ. The Death of Death in the Death of Christ. He wrote this book uh, in 1648. So he was 32 when he wrote this book, uh, which, by the way, is amazing in itself. This book, uh, this edition is by Banner of Truth again, and it has about a 25-page introdu introduction by a man named J.I. Packer, who's still alive. He's sort of been the main, um, the main funnel by which we've understood the Puritans in the last 50 or so years. And this book is worth read getting just because of the introductory essay. Uh, I reread it. It's, let me see, yeah, it's 25 pages. It's the best thing I've ever read, just as far as a short little summary, on basically why Calvinism is the best the best uh, view of, the best interpretation of Scripture, of how Christ saves. So that's a, a wonderful little essay. Um, the, the point of the death of death of the de in the death of Christ is to show that the L in tulip, that is limited atonement, is biblical. Uh, I don't know if you're all familiar with that. What Owen is trying to tell us and teach us is that Jesus Christ's death on the cross is efficient and effective to save all whom it was intended to save. And what he says is that everyone who Jesus intends to save, Jesus absolutely will save. So Jesus did not die for everyone who has ever lived in the history of the world, which is, uh, in Owen's era, a major teaching, and in our era is a major teaching. Owen says that is false, that is not biblical, that is not true, that is not logical, that is not sensical, and he gives just an absolutely masterful argument as to why that's the case. Um, so it's about what, what's known in the history of theology as limited atonement, or, which I like better, particular redemption. That is, it's answering the question, who did Jesus die for? So that's uh, in itself controversial and interesting and fun to learn about and think about. If you're a Christian, you need to know about that. That's a pretty important thing, the death of Christ in Christianity. Uh, this is the best book on it. So what, what I want to do is give you three arguments that he uses, okay? The main argument, darn, I don't think this is going to work. All right, good. Three arguments, um, and what he does really is the first half of the book is um, just hardcore textual work in the text of Scripture. All sorts of texts, amazing amount of Bible in the first half of the book. The second half of the book is 
application of what we've seen in the first half of the book regarding the death of Christ. So you'll find him in the Gospel of John. You'll find him in Ephesians. You'll find him in Romans. You'll find him in Revelation. He's all over the New Testament. And uh, it's brilliant. It's outstanding work. Here's his main argument. He says, with regard to the question of who Christ died for, there are three possibilities. Okay, Either Christ died for all the sins of all men, Okay, follow? Some sins of all men or all the sins of good. Some men. Those are your options. Those are the only three options right there. Okay? And so here's what he does. After he's done all this biblical work, he says this. If Jesus Christ on the cross in his substitutionary atoning death died for some of the sins of all men, then all men are still what? Under some sin. They still have to pay the debt on some of their sins. And thus, because if if we are not completely righteous before God, we are condemned. Thus, because not all of our sins are paid for, we've got to pay for the rest, which means we're going to hell. Okay, so if Jesus paid for some of the sins of all men, then no one is going to be saved. That's the point. So no one holds that position. That's a Christian, anyway. So he nixes that one early on. And then it boils down to these two. He says, secondly, if Jesus Christ died for, and this is very important, all, all, everyone, all the sins of all men then all men who have ever lived, who have ever taken breath in this universe, will be saved. But, he says, the Bible clearly teaches the reality of hell, doesn't it? It clearly teaches, and also history and experience in anyone's life clearly teach that not all people are saved. And so here's where um, the opponents of Owen, who we'll call Arminians, uh, named after Jacob Arminius who taught this, they say, well... Jesus died for all the sins of all men, but some men don't believe that that's the case, and that's why they're not saved. Now, here's what Owen says. He asks a simple question. Is unbelief a sin? Is it wrong not to believe in Jesus? Yes, okay? Unbelief is a sin. Well, then, did Jesus die for every sin but the sin of unbelief? No, you're saying he died for all sins. If he died for all sins, then he also died for the sin of infidelity to the gospel, the sin of unbelief. Therefore, if Jesus died for all the sins of all men, including their unbelief, then those men will be saved. But the Bible doesn't teach that, and clearly not everyone is saved. So the only remaining answer is what Owen affirms and what the Bible affirms is that Jesus died for all the sins of some men. That is, everyone who is saved... Jesus died for. And there's no one who Jesus died for that isn't saved. Okay? Let me read some of the quotes to you. Really, just this main argument here is a summary of what I just said. Um, And I want to read the very end of it. He says there, Is this unbelief a sin or not? If not, why should they be punished for it, etc.? And then, last couple of sentences. If so, that is, if unbelief is a sin, then why must that hinder them more than their other sins for which he died from partaking of the fruit of his death? If he did not, then he did not die for all their sins. Let them choose which part they will. So Owen says that basically Jesus' death is absolutely effective. It does exactly what it was intended to do. Okay, No one can thwart what Jesus intended to to do and what Jesus accomplished in his death. What he intended to do, according to Owen, is save his elect, is save his sheep, is save his church. Those were all terms that you see in the New Testament over and over again. When Jesus says in John, for example, that he came for his sheep and none of his sheep will ever be snatched out of his hand. That's exactly true. Jesus Christ saves all whom he intends to save. If Jesus had intended to save every human who's ever lived, then every human who's ever lived would be saved. That's the, the force, that's the, the point of Owen's main argument. Okay, let me go over two more really briefly, 
and then um, I'll have time for questions. Actually, I'm going to skip the second one and go straight to the third argument. So 3C on your outline. This is very important, and in a sense, it's subsidiary of this first main argument. What he says basically is that universal redemption, or the idea that Jesus died for every person who's ever lived, steals glory from God. Because in the end, it is man who is the determining factor in his salvation. Now, I want you to pay attention to this quote. I'm going to read it. Here's what he writes. Arminians must resolve almost the sole cause of our salvation into ourselves ultimately, it being in our own power to make all that God and Christ do unto that end effectual, or to frustrate their utmost endeavors for that purpose. For all that is done, whether in the Father's loving us and sending his Son to die for us, or in the Son's offering himself for a sacrifice in our stead, is confessedly of no value nor worth in respect of any profitable issue unless we believe. The effect is such that the soul-casting voice, whether we will believe or not, is left to ourselves. Now, whether this be not to assign unto ourselves the cause of our own happiness and to make us the chief builders of our own glory, let all judge. Now, that's a mouthful. What he's saying there is basically this. <clears throat> if you're going to argue that everyone who's ever lived, Jesus died for, okay? And if you're going to argue that not everyone who's ever lived is saved, then you have to answer this question. Why are some saved and not others? What the Arminians say, what Owen is fighting against, is that the reason that I'm saved and not the guy next door to me who doesn't believe and isn't a Christian is because I believe and because he didn't believe. Somehow, some way, I found it in myself to, to muster up the power to believe in Jesus, but this guy didn't do it. Therefore, at the end of the day, the reason I am saved and not him is because I believed and he didn't. Because I worked on it and he didn't. Because I had some ability that he didn't have. And therefore, at least to some degree, I am responsible for my own salvation. You see that? Owen says that is an absolute theft of God's glory. Because as Jonah 2.9 says, salvation is of the Lord. And the only reason that I am saved as opposed to Joe Blow or that you're saved as opposed to anyone else is because Jesus Christ chose to save you. Okay? If Jesus had, in his sovereign wisdom, chosen to die for X person, then X person would undoubtedly be saved. So what Owen is saying is that by affirming this third option, that's the only way we can affirm that salvation is truly God's, and that because that is true, all glory for salvation goes to God. You see, if we really believe, Owen says, if we really believe that salvation is by grace, if we really believe that it's by grace and has nothing to do with our merit, with our power, with our ability, nothing to do with us at all, then this is the only logical, biblical option. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a very, very brief summary of the death of death. Uh, it's... Um, it's, not, it's not answerable, in my opinion. Um, and, I, you know, I know this is a very controversial issue. Um, I know that there's much disagreement among brothers and sisters about this issue. And I, um, we need to be humble and thoughtful and loving. But all that in mind, and I'm try I hope I say this with all that in mind, this is fundamental to the gospel and it's fundamental to the glory of God and that's why this book is so um, so helpful and why Owen's work has has still gone down as the best thing ever written about this subject over 400 years now so if this is something that's new to you you have questions about it I'd love to talk to you more uh, this is a review for you then that's helpful too I hope uh, real quick any questions about this book in particular this idea in particular yeah Martha Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, that's something I need not have time to talk about. In the last, the question is, did he ad address evangelism in the Great Commission? And the answer is yes. The last hundred pages of this book or so are an answer to the most common objections against this view. 
and he handles the scripture texts that are often used against this view, like uh, God desires that all be saved, 2 Timothy 3, I think, or 2 Timothy 2, something like that, and uh, other texts, whole world passages, etc. He deals with every one of those, and then he deals with all the logical slash theological arguments, like doesn't this mean that evangelism is, is futile and unnecessary? So yes, he absolutely addresses all of those. He gives 16 arguments um, against each little specific objection to this truth. And I don't even have time to get into that. But yes, Ben. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's uh, just one real quick anecdote. I don't know we're out of time. I had someone give me a, a paper this week. Um, who's a friend of mine, a paper on, and you know, it's been a while since I've really di- dove into this subject. And this subject changed my life years ago, but it's been a while since I've gotten into it until the last couple of weeks. Anyway, this guy gave me a paper on, you know, basically why this is the view and not this one. Why, you know, Arminianism is the better view. And I read it, and he did a lot of good referencing in this paper on Calvinist theologians, but he never even mentioned Owen. And so I, you know, hand the paper back to him. I said, you know, come back when you've read this and when you have an answer for this. Um, and Ben's right. No one's ever answered it. No one that I'm aware of. Um, I'd love to see one, but I don't think it can be answered. So very, very important subject. Very controversial subject today as it was then, but uh, that doesn't mean we should shy away from it. Okay, Brett, you have the last word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Packer's book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, is great. And what that book is, he he says this in the preface, is basically um, an outworking of one of jo- John Owen's 16 arguments in this book. So, yeah, very helpful. Okay, thanks for listening. And uh, sorry we're late. Let me pray and we're, we'll be finished. Thank you, Lord, for your grace to us in Christ. Thank you for your sovereignty. We do proclaim that you are the sovereign God, the Lord of salvation, that you have given to sal- salvation to whom you will, and we, we don't know why you chose to save us. We certainly don't deserve it, and yet we thank you that um, in your sovereign good pleasure you chose to show us your mercy. We thank you that Jesus' death is effective, that it actually accomplished salvation. It didn't just make salvation possible. It actually made it um, evident and true in our lives, and we thank you for that. And we, as we enter into worship now, Lord, we ask that the death of Jesus Christ would be real and true and heartfelt in our minds and that it would it would draw out our praise and it would draw out our reverence and it would it would draw out our joy and lord we thank you that you've used a man like john owen to help us understand that biblical truth better and we pray that you would continue to grant us humility under the authority of your word which uh is a clear clear source and clear reference point for us on this and we pray these things in jesus name amen thank you guys see you next week